I have always admired men for their strength, their courage, their enterprise, their unceasing struggle for the beyond, something else. But not until I had to deal with a crewman did I realize the vastness to which this latter characteristic of theirs could attain. One might have been excused for thinking that a man without rates and taxes, without pockets, and without the manifold, wanting culture of modern European civilization and education would necessarily have been bounded to some, to some, in some extent in his desires. But one would have been wrong, profoundly wrong, and so thinking, for the crewman yearns after and duns for as many things for his body as the lamented Faust did for his soul, and away among the apes this interesting creature would have to go at once if the wanting of little were a crucial test for the determination of the family termed by the scientific world the hominid. Later, when I got to know the crewmen well, I learned that they desired not only the vast majority of the articles that they saw, but did more, but did more, obtained them, at all events, some of them, without asking me for them. Such commodities, for example, as fowls, palm wine, old tins and bottles, and other gentlemen's wives were never safe. One of that first gang of boys showed self-help to such a remarkable degree that I christened him Smiles. His name, UBDD, being both protracted and improper, called for the change of some sort, but even this brought no comfort to one still hampered with the conventional ideas reg regarding property, and frequent roll calls were found necessary, so that the crimes of my friend Smiles and his fellows might not accumulate in accumulate to an unimaginable, unmanageable extent. This used to be the sort of thing where them netterlash lib, him lib for drunk, massa, where them smiles, he lib for town, for steel, massa, where them black man misery, but I draw a veil over the confessional, for there is simply no artistic retinence about your crewman when he is telling the truth or otherwise regarding a fellow creature. After accumulating with this gang enough experience to fill a hat, remembering always one of the worst things you can do in West Africa is to worry yourself, I bethought me of the advice I had received from my cousin, Rose Kingsley, who had successfully ridden through Mexico when Mexico was having a rather worse revolution than usual, to always preserve a firm manner. I thought I would try this on those crew boys and said, no, in place of, I wish you would not do that, please. I can't say that it was immediate success. During this period, we came across a trader's lonely store wherein he had a consignment of red parasols. After these appalling objects, the souls of my crewmen hungered. After these appalling objects, the souls of my crewmen hungered with a great desire. No, said I, in my severest tone, and after buying other things, we passed on. Imagine my horror, therefore, hours afterwards and miles away, to find my precious crew had got a red parasol, a p red parasol apiece. Previous experience quite justified me in thinking that these had been stolen, and I pictured to myself my Portuguese friends, whose territory I was then in, commenting upon the incident and reviling me as another instance of how the brutal English go looting through the land. I found, however, I was wrong, for the parasols had been dashed, my rapacious rascals, for top, and the last one connected with the affair, who deserves pity, was the traitor from whom I had believed them stolen. It was I, not he, who had suffered, for it was the wet season in West Africa, and those red parasols ran. To this day, my scientific soul has never been able to account for the vast body of crimson dye those miserable cotton things poured out plentifully drenching myself and their owners, the crew boys, and everything we associated with that day. I am quite prepared to hear that some subsequent wanderer has found a red trail in Africa itself like that one sees so often upon the maps. When they do, I hereby claim that the real red trail as mine. I confess I like the African on the whole, a thing I never expected to do when I went to the coast with the idea that he was a deranged, savage, cruel brute that is a trifling error you soon get rid of when you know him. 
the true boy is decidedly the most likable of all Africans that I know, wherein his charm lies is difficult to describe, and you certainly want the patience of Job and a conscience made of stretching leather to deal with the true boy in the African climate and live. In his better manifestations, he reminded me of that charming personality, the Irish peasant, for though he lacks the sparkle, he is full of humor and is the laziest and most industrious of mankind. He lies and tells the truth in such a hopelessly uncertain manner that you cannot rely on him for either. He is ungrateful and faithful to the death, honest and thievish, all in one and the same specimen of him. Ingratitude is a crime laid very frequently to the score of all Africans, but I think unfairly. Certainly I have never had to complain of it, and the crewmen often show gratitude for good treatment in a grand way. The way those crew boys of the gallant Captain Lane helped him work Lagos Bar and save lives by the dozen from the str stranded ships on it and hauled their massa out from among the sharky foam every time he went into it on the lifeboat upsetting would have done credit to Deal or Norfolk lifeboat men. But the secret of their devotion is their personal attachment. They do not save people out of the surf on abstract moral principles. The African at large is not an enthusiast on moral principles, and one and all they'll let nature take its course if they don't feel keen on a man surviving. Half the African in African's ingratitude, although it may look very bad on paper, is really not so very bad, for half the time you have been asking him to be grateful to you for doing so, or giving him things he does not care a row of pins about. I have quite his feelings, for example, for half the things in civilized countries I am expected to be glad to get. Oh, how nice it must be to be able to get about in cars, omnibuses, and railway trains again. Is it? Well, I don't think so, and I do not feel glad over it. Similarly, we will take an African case of ingratitude. A white friend of mine put himself to an awful lot of trouble to save the life of one of his sub-traders who had an accident and succeeded. It had been the custom of the man's wife to bring the trader little presents of fowls, etc., from time to time, and some time after the accident he met the lady and told her he had noticed a falling off in her offerings, and he thought her very ungrateful after what he had done for her husband. She grunted, and the next morning she brings in as a present the most forlorn, skinny, one-and-a-half feathered chicken you ever laid eyes on. And, in answer to the trader's comments, she said, Massa, for sure, them dare chicken be no particularly good chicken, but for sure them dare man be no particularly good man. They go, i.e. they match each other. I have referred at great length to the crewmen because of their importance, and also because they are the natives the white men have more to do with as servants than any other. But methods of getting on with them are not necessarily applicable to dealing with other forms of African laborers, such as plantation hands on the Congo Francais, Angola, and Cameroon. In Cameroon, the Germans are now using largely the Bantanga natives on the plantations. The Dulas, the great trading tribe in Cameroon River, being too lazy to do any heavy work, and they have also tried to import laborers from Togo land, but this attempt was not a success, ending in the revolt of 1894, which lost several white lives. The public work is carried on, as it is in our own colonies, by the criminals in the Kane chain gang. The Germans have had many accusations hurled against them by people of their own nationality, but on the whole, these atrocities have been much exaggerated and only half understood, and certainly have not amounted to anything like things that have gone on in the philanthropic Congo Free State. The food given out by the German government is the best government rations given on the whole West Coast. When they have allowed me to have some of their native employees, as I as when I went up as when I was up Cameroon Mountains, for example, I brought rations from the government stores for them, and that was much struck by the soundness and good quality of both rice and beef and the rations they gave out to those Dahomeys or Togolanders who revolted was so much the more than they could or cared to eat, that they used to sell much of it to the doulas in Bell Town. This is not open to the criticism that the stuff was too bad for the Togolanders to eat, as was once said to me by a philanthropic German who had never been to the coast, because the doulas are a rich tribe, perfectly free traders in that matter, 
able to go to the river factories and buy provisions there had they wished to, and so would not have bought the government rations unless they were worth having. The great point that has been brought the Germans into disrepute with the natives employed by them is their military spirit, which gives rise to a desire to regulate everything, and that other attribute of the military spirit, nagging. You should never nag an African. It only makes him bothered and then sulky, and when he's sulky, he'll lie down and die to spite you. But in spite of the Germans being overgiven to this unpleasant habit of military regularity and so on, the natives from the Crew Coast and from Bassa and the French Ivory Coast return to them time after time for spells of work. So there must be grave, grave exaggeration regarding their bad treatment, for these natives are perfectly free in the matter.